Since Jesus is the way, I was thinking about this. How can anyone claim to be in the Father's family without going through the blood of Jesus? If you're willing to go through the same process Jesus went through, you too can become a son. But not without your blood. Because it's blood brothers. Blood to blood. I lay down my life because he laid down his life and made it possible for me to lay down my life. Melchizedek has to be the father. We talked the whole four-hour message last Saturday on Melchizedek. And Melchizedek has to be the father because Elohim, Melchizedek, he's the father of us all. Okay? And Abram received the spiritual DNA and then God cut the covenant with Abram naturally. He put him in the bloodline when he cut that covenant through that bloodline. See, Jesus had not died. So that's why you go through Abraham at that point until Jesus died. Everybody went through that blood covenant. That's why the blood covenant is talked about. It's about covenant, covenant, covenant all the time. Why? It was the old covenant. That's how you got to God. You had to kill an animal and shed his blood in order for your sins to be forgiven. But when Jesus came... He became the offering once and for all. And Christ, he opened the door for us to come through and lay our lives down. It's all about blood. Why? DNA. So God cut the covenant with Abram naturally. That little thing he did, I've been thinking about it. And when you, they would walk through the pieces and they would do a figure eight. That's the way I heard it. Figure eight. What is a figure eight? Think about what else it is besides a figure eight. Infinity. That's what's been coming to me. Infinity. This is the covenant. See, Jesus came through the covenant too. He came through the covenant of Abraham because he was born through Abraham. See? So infinity, that means eternal life. Everybody that comes through this covenant gets eternal life. Infinity. So get this. I see these veils. I see how God, as we go through life, you know, starting at the very beginning with the, the covenant of Abraham, there were veils. The New Testament was not revealed. The, the New Testament is the Old Testament revealed. The, the Old Testament is the New Testament concealed. So God has veils that he takes off. And he reveals higher levels. Like, for instance, if you would have um, sprinkled your child in baptism versus dunking them, you know, you'd have a big uproar about that not too long ago. Because baptism was, you got to dunk, and you can't sprinkle. And it was a big to-do about that. All kinds of denominations were split for that. Well, the veil came off. And now it's no big deal. I'll use a natural one. Slavery was a common thing. You, you had slavery. Some people lost their lives to slavery. They had to be a slave for the rest of their, uh, the time that they owed that money. They had to be a slave. That was a common life form. Well, there is no more slavery now. There is a veil that's been torn off. We don't live like that anymore. So all through the ages, I see God revealing more of himself. Because there's like, from the beginning of time, there were all these veils. But he cuts these veils, and we come up higher. That's how it works. Now watch. For so long, we've had a veil on us that says Jesus is the only Son of God. But in 1 Peter 1, it says a, another salvation is going to be revealed in the end time. It's been a veil. This is, Daniel talks about the, the books being sealed. There's a veil there. Nobody's going to know about that unless they reach. Now, David would reach through those veils because the intimacy that he had with God, God don't care. He, he'll, he'll show you the veils. Come on. If you're willing to take the journey, he'll show it to you. But the problem is it's hard to get the whole um, culture in with you in that, through that veil. But it's available. And that's why 
And I'm not being prideful when I say this, but that's why I am so serious about the truth. It's because I want those veils off. I know my daddy will give me whatever I want. If I come to him and I say, Father, reveal yourself to me. I want to see you. I'm willing to take the journey. So I come here taking that journey and sharing with you what he shows me. And so these veils are not on my eyes. I can see him face to face as opposed to a glass darkly. Like some people see him. The ones that see that Jesus is the only son of God, they see him through a glass darkly because they're not willing to stand face to face and let God look at them and judge their sin. Oh, they don't know anything about that. That's the blood of Jesus covers me. I don't have to go and be judged by the Father. Well, there is a generation that's rising up. This another salvation is being revealed in the end time. And God is showing me that there's two camps. And we'll get to that. But there's two camps. Billy Graham did his job, and he got them through the door. That's why we have salvation. The seeds of salvation is here in this nation. But you don't stop there. There is a holy place that the salvation is the altar of incense. Or is that bronze altar? I get confused. But anyway, it's the altar where you lay your life down, which is the cross. And it's also the laver, which is baptism. But that's just step one. Then you go into the holy place. And there is the menorah, which is the lampstand, which is the Holy Spirit. And there's the showbread, the table of showbread, which is the word of God. And this is supposed to be in you. You're supposed to be the temple. So you've got the Holy Spirit, you, you come through the cross, you come through baptism, and then you've got the Holy Spirit, you've got that illumination, and you've got the Word of God growing in you, that DNA, and then you know what you get to go to after that? Then, there was a veil there, and then on the other side of that veil was the Ark of the Covenant and the Mercy Seat. Those were two different pieces. And the high priest would enter into that most holy place one time a year and bring the blood and offer it on the mercy seat. So what is that a type and shadow of? Guys, I am here to teach you and me how to become the ark that houses the presence of God. That is not some hookah booga stuff. And I'm going to tell you, they were scared to death to go into that most holy place. But yet... I know Jesus pierced the veil. I mean, he tore that, that that veil was rent from top to bottom. And the way has been made where you can go. But that doesn't mean that you don't go through the death of self to get in there. You have to kill that Adamic nature. So that you can go into the most holy place. So Jesus, people believe that Jesus is the son of God. But see, there's a veil there. It's more than Jesus is the son of God. He pierced the veil to bring many sons to glory so that they can be sons of God. That's what I'm here to teach. Another salvation being revealed in the end times. You can go through the blood of Jesus, and I'll show you where you end up because you have a mediator. Or you can go through the blood of Jesus with your own life and lay your life down and become a son, a Melchizedek priest, king priest, where you will rule and reign with Christ. Everywhere Christ goes, you're in that body, and you will be with him for eternal life. That's what I'm here to teach you. Those veils come off. That's the end time. When the end time gets here, you're at the end of those veils. There's no more veils. You see it. It's all culmination. I consider myself a culminator. It it says in the Bible, it says, You will eat from vineyards you did not plant and live in houses you did not build. So I go around and the Holy Spirit leads me to people that have done so much work. I mean, so much work in Hebrew and in Greek and got 500 messages on the Internet and just all this stuff. And I do study a lot. And I, I study and I listen and I go, 
mm, that's bones. We've got to spit that out. But I get that meat that they work for. And that's how I get my stuff. Because I ain't got 20 years. I don't have 20 years to sit there and do what they did. So I get to live in houses that they built. And I get to eat from vineyards that they, they planted that I didn't. And I just culminate. I just come in and culminate, culminate, culminate. And then I develop my message, which is a higher message. They worked so hard to get that high message, but it's not high enough. Because there's another salvation to be revealed in the end time. See? So the sons will arise because a generation has been promised from the foundation of the world to Jesus. He's waiting for those ones to have the Christ, the DNA formed in them. And that's when tribulation begins. Go ahead. The sons are the DNA, the fullness of Christ. It's, it's in the Bible that Jesus is the first fruits and he wants his other first fruits. In Revelation 14, the ones that are the 144,000 faithful virgins that had their father on their forehead, the name of their father and Jesus on their forehead. Why? Because they're in the family. What, on the forehead, what does that mean? I just told you. The DNA, that's the mark. There's not going to be a literal mark or a, a, a chip that goes in your body. It's your DNA. What comes out of your mouth is your mark. It's who you are. You're either in the DNA of the tree of life or you're in the DNA of the tree of, of knowledge of good and evil. That's the mark. But in the 144,000, those are the virgins that are without guile in their mouth. They've laid their life down. They're one with Christ. Those are the, it calls them the first fruits. You know why? I figured it out today. Because the Bible says there will be two resurrections. And blessed are those who take part in the first resurrection. What is that a resurrection of? The Christ's. So he says it's appointed for a man once to die and then judgment. Does that mean that when I die, I immediately face judgment? No, the Bible is very specific. Judgment doesn't happen until after millennium. So therefore, he's not talking about that. What he's talking about is when you lay your life down, that's judgment. It's appointed for a man who wants to die. You are required to lay your life down in this world to have eternal life. And that's judgment. But then it goes on, and it says that you are the first fruits because those people die and they're resurrected in the spiritual. It doesn't matter if it happens in the physical or not. Because their Adamic nature was killed. So they die, and then they go on that journey. They're going on that journey to be at the right hand of the Father to be connected in that body of Christ. And then Jude says they come back on horses. That's in the spirit realm. Some of them, the ones that have gone before the Christ in the Bible, they're coming back for the end time, for the tribulation. And they'll be coming back. We'll get different bodies. I don't know if it'll happen on this earth. Or if, it'll, if our body will come back, our spirit will, I don't know how that will work, but I know I get what's going on. But that's the first resurrection. You know when the second resurrection is? After the millennium. So if you are a baby Christian that wants to poo-poo in your diaper and claim the blood of Jesus, and you die during tribulation, because you will, you don't even get to see the millennium, the thousand-year peace reign. That's what the Bible says. That's the second resurrection. Blessed is the one who, gets, who takes part in the first resurrection. And it says if you die in the first death, the second death won't hurt you. So if I lay down my life, then and somebody kills me during the tribulation, or whatever, it's not going to hurt me. That's what he's saying. That's exactly what the word is saying. So they are the first fruits. That's what tribulation is all about. Is that... He's coming after the second fruits. The whole point of us today is I'm here to develop the first fruits so we don't have to go through tribulation. We're the ones that rule and reign through tribulation. But if you don't heed my cry, then you will take part in the second fruits. And it won't be as nice. I mean, it's been hard. It's going to be hard either way. But 
you will have to physically lay down your life in tribulation to be part of the second fruit. 1 Corinthians 13, 9 through 12. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part, but when that which is perfect is come, then that which... When I was a child, I spoke as a child. I understood as a child. I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. See, I'm developing from a baby in a crib to a mature man. I wasn't able to take on the family business when I was a baby. But he expects us to grow up. And when we do, and our rules become his rule, I mean, our his rules become our rules, then he can hand the family business over to us. For now we see through a glass darkly. Everywhere it talks about the word panim, face. It means judgment. You will go through the judgment of God if you want to see him face to face. And judgment gives you sight. You're not holy, then you can't see. You can't see truth if you're not seeking holiness. That's why it's so important that you have clean hands and a pure heart at all times. Now I know in part, but then shall I know even as also I am known. When I have the same DNA, I'm transformed. Go ahead, Tim. That was said after this was said in John 14, 1 through 4. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. See, they believed in God because they believed through Moses, through the law. You believed in the law. Believe also in me. I came for the new covenant. This is the new covenant. He's taken a veil off. They only knew about God and the promise of a Messiah. They knew a Messiah was promised, but they didn't know this one was it. Or he was the one that was coming to open the way. In my father's house. Now, this is the one where people claim that you got a mansion in heaven because he's coming back to get your little precious self and take you in the rapture. But watch what this says. In my father's house. Who lives in your house? Your family, right? In our world... Not everybody in our, in our family has our DNA. But somewhere, like, like Madison has Tim's DNA. Ashley has my DNA. So we still are in our house. We have the same DNA. Right? So in my father's house are many dwelling places. Think of how DNA is put together. It's connected. These are the places that you're, you're getting. That's kind of how I see it. If it were not so, I would have told you. For I go to prepare a place for you. That place is the body of Christ and that DNA at the right hand of the Father. And when you die to self, you go on that journey and you can have it. But think of the Father's house as a family tree. Because you can be part of my family tree. If I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself. How do you do that? Through the Holy Spirit. Through the path to holiness. I will receive you to myself. I will come back into your heart. You can now, he can now be in our heart. And he will lead us on that path. Back into oneness at the right hand of the Father. That where I am. Here it is. There you may be also. What, are you apart from your body? Do your cells just kind of. Are they floating everywhere? No they're all together. That where I am, you may be also. That all my cells can make up the body of Christ. The Holy Spirit brings, in, brings, brings us into holiness so that we can be joined to that DNA. Because don't you dare think that you're going to join to that DNA when you're a cancerous cell. And you know the way where I'm going. But the thing is, is you've got to follow him. And you know what he says about following me. Go ahead, Tim. How do we follow him? Matthew 16, 24 through 27. Then Jesus said to his disciples, If anyone wishes to follow me, come after me. He must deny himself. In other words, you can't build your life in this world. Take up your cross. 
a life of suffering and burden. You know, a cross was a burden that you had to bear. And it's going to be pain. It's going to be suffering. And follow me. A company on a journey. You know what I learned this week? There's a difference between a member of a church and a disciple. A disciple is one who picks up his cross and follows him. A member of a church, the devil doesn't, he's not scared of you at all. But he shakes in his boots. uh, Revelation 12 says he's right there to try to stop the Christ being formed in you. That man child that's trying to be formed in you, he's there to stop that. He's scared to death when Christ is formed in a human He knows he's in trouble. But a member of a church, he ain't bothered by that. And when you go the same way, where do you go? To the right hand. For whoever wishes to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. That's what it means when you kill the Adamic nature, that fleshly human nature that you've got to crucify that the, Jesus went through those temptations in the wilderness those three things that I hope we get to tonight but I don't know we'll see where the, the slide is <clears throat> for what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul if you're here to build your kingdom right here you're giving your soul right to the devil Oh, but you got a good kingdom here that's going to turn into dust. Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? What would it take? We talk about the fact that the devil wants your soul. You sold your soul to the devil. Would you sell your soul to the devil to be a rock star for 50 years? Because the rock stars that are 70 aren't very good to look at anymore (laughs) so really I mean not even 50 I'd say because you're a kid so so really you become if you become a rock star at 20 your life expectancy is 30 years would you sell your soul to be a rock star where everybody worships you like a god for 30 years people have done it The devil gives us the matrix, a lie, temporal riches for our soul. For the Son of Man is going to come once he dies to self. That's the Son of Man once the Adamic nature is killed. And he's raised to the right hand in resurrection in that body of Christ. The Son of Man is going to come. See, that means he's there because it says you're raised to the right hand of the Father. He's going to come in the glory of his Father because you're a body with his angels and will then repay every man according to his deeds. Every man. Whether you're producing good fruit or bad fruit, that's what your deeds are. The Son of Man is the DNA, the family of wrought sons because they paid the price and you wouldn't. They are your judges because you loved your life too much in this world and they didn't. They loved you more than they loved their life. That's why they're your judges. Go ahead. Now watch this. Romans 8, 28 through 30. And we know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. You know what God showed me that this week? He said, baby, he said, that doesn't apply to sinners. That doesn't apply to Christians that claim that they're mine and I'm theirs. That only applies to people who are wanting that that Christ formed in them. Oh man, the church loves to quote that one. The baby Christians that want to poo-poo in their diaper and fall short of grace. 
But it says those who love God and are called according to his purpose. What's his purpose? He wants everybody to come back to his family. Who's out there doing that for me? Then I'm going to make sure that everything they do is going to be blessed. I'm going to get behind them. Philadelphia says you have little power. I'm going to get behind them, and I'm going to make sure that all things work together for the good. Everything they put their hand to. For those whom he foreknew, now this is where the Presbyterians go all nuts, but if you'd only look at the Hebrew and the Greek, it would be plain to see. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to become conformed to the image of his son. What are we talking about tonight? The DNA of Christ. The image of his son. That couldn't be more plain. The DNA of his son. So that he would be the firstborn among brethren. So in other words, it's something that's picked, that's ready. But all the other things are not ready. The first fruits, the firstborn. You're, you're going to be raised out of the crowd because you're different. Because you're, you laid your life down and they didn't. You're different in a crowd. Firstborn among many brethren and these whom he predestined, he also called. Who are we talking about? We're talking about Christ. That's why the church gets this all wrong. He predestined, he also called, and these whom he called, he also justified, and these whom he justified, he also glorified. These are Christ's. Foreknew is the word prognis- prognosco. And he knew the Christ before the foundation of the world. Because in the beginning, I don't know if we'll get to that slide tonight, but in the beginning, God created, that word is bara. And it means to cut. What is he cutting? He's cutting that DNA. He's cutting pieces of that DNA and he's sending them through the epics of time. That's what he did. So he foreknew them before the foundation of the world. And he predestined them. You know what that means? Perizzo, to limit the number in advance. In other words, there aren't as many tolas as there are good seeds. To be conformed is the word sumorphos, and it means jointly formed, conformed, to be fashioned like unto. How does that happen? DNA. And they are called, that word is kaleo, and it means to sight, to command, to urge onward. See? Those who are called. uh, God causes all things to work together for good because he's urging them onward. That that cell inside of them, that Christ inside of them is crying out, Abba, Father, I want to come back to you. That fullness. So they're called. They're commanded. They're urged onward. They get depressed, just like David. But David encouraged himself in the Lord because he had that Christ that was forming in him. That he justified. That word is dekayu, and it means to make righteous. He made him righteous through his blood. He glorified. Dox, azo. He gave them honor. And magnify them. How do you produce fruit if you don't have life inside of you? He says, be fruitful. Not look at my fruit. You be fruitful. So you have to have the ability to form that fruit inside of you. It's glory. He'll glorify you. If you are like a kernel of wheat that falls to the ground and dies, it will produce much fruit. Romans 12, 1 through 2. Therefore I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living and holy sacrifice, acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship, your reasonable worship. I expect this of you. 
Log, logikos, and it means reasonable. It's not crazy. I'm not expecting something off the wall. You're a Christ. I expect you to lay down your life and become a toller for all the people around you. You've got the ability to change the world inside of you, but yet you want to just sit there and do what you want to do? It's not going to go well for them when they face their father. But that sacrifice is your worship unto God. Remember I told you, when you are in line, when you've laid down your life, you are constantly in the mind of Christ. That DNA, you're constantly thinking about the, the Bible and it's being formed in you. And what's happening is you're releasing worship. And it's like sonar. It's hallel. It's called a hallel. And it goes out and then it comes back as revelation. More revelation. So you get that revelation and what does it make you want to do? Praise even more. So it's this constant flow. That's why I get this revelation all the time. Because I don't just sit there and watch TV and veg out on my brain. I'm constantly thinking the Word of God is going in all the time. And therefore it's going out and it's coming back more. And that's why I move at the speed of light. You think you got me on a week? On Saturday I come out and pour everything out to you. By the time I get back here on Saturday, I'm 100 miles ahead of you. Because that's how fast I move because I'm constantly moving with the, with the Word. Are you? That's your reasonable sacrifice. Reasonable. Because if you don't do it, then you're going to stand before God. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed. Don't let the world make you into itself. Do you know that Egypt, they worship the dung beetle? Do you know that they're nothing but a pile of trash today? You actually walk on trash when you go to Egypt. Because you become what you look at. What you behold, you become. So what are you looking at? You're looking at TV? Because that's what you're going to become. But if you're looking at the Word, you will not be conformed to this world, but you will be transformed by the renewing of your mind. So that you may prove renewing of your what? Your mind, your DNA, your subconscious, your conscious feeding into that subconscious so that you may prove so that you may prove so that through doing this you may prove the will of the Lord that which is good that's the, be that's the beginning of your salvation process that's acceptable is where you're getting you're working out your soul good is where you got saved acceptable is where you're working out your soul with uh, fear and trembling and perfect is when you are spirit, soul, and body conformed into the image of Christ. And he becomes, you become the Ark of the Covenant that houses the presence of God as a human. That's intense. Conformed is the word shushimatazo, and it means to fashion alike. Conform to the same pattern. Transform, metamorpho, changed, transfigured, metamorphous. What does that mean? You change your habits. You change your form. That's what DNA does. Did you know you can actually change your DNA? You can have cancer. There are people that have had cancer. They went through and looked at all their beliefs, got themselves out of that environment, of what they were feeding their, their, their DNA, their spirit, and they don't have any more cancer, even without God. They have done that because they got off the tree of knowledge of good and evil, death, and they got onto the tree of life. We were created to be able to heal ourselves by changing the habits, by, by not eating that death. So your subconscious is your character, your condition, your function. Even a change in the structure of body tissue happens. You're genetically transformed. That's intense, guys. Go ahead. I'm going to 
going to do one more. Philippians 3, 7 through 11. More than that, I count all things to be lost in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. I count all things to be lost. I could be a rock star and get everything in the world, but I count that as dung, rubbish. That's what he said, dung. That's dung pile. But what I want to know is I want the value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. You know what that means? My master. Yes, sir. I'm obedient to you. My will. Yes, sir. I'm in that body. Now, how do you get there? For whom I have suffered the loss of all things. And count them but rubbish. Why? So that I may gain Christ. The DNA being formed in me. That I may gain Christ. That I may be on that family tree. And may be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own, derived from the law. See? But that which is through faith in Christ... The righteousness which comes from God on the basis of faith that I may know him. And three things. The power of his resurrection. So that is the death and power of the resurrection to be raised at the right hand of the Father. The fellowship of his sufferings. Me and you, Father, you're the only one that knows I'm going through this trouble right now. That's fellowship. That's brotherhood. That's family. Being conformed to his death. You've got to die with that Adamic nature. In order that I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. Conformed to his death. Sumorphanzomony. To have the same form that Christ took on in his death is to go through the veil that he pierced for me. Can you find the, the slide that has the... Um, Melchizedek, there it is right there. Was that the next slide? Okay, I want to show y'all what God showed me this week. This is God's family tree. This is how it works. After the order of Melchizedek, he was the one who gave the spiritual DNA to Abraham. It had to be the father. Couldn't have been anybody else. Had to be the father. I mean, it might have been somebody else from the first world possibly, but still, even if we go all the way through, it's the Father, because the Father is the Father to us all, right? So it makes more sense to me that it is the Father. But it's after the order of Melchizedek, then Melchizedek gives the spiritual DNA to Abram. Abraham gives it to Isaac, and then Jacob has the sons, okay? And Jacob has Levi, who is the Levitical priests. They are not king priests. They are Levitical priests under the law that used animals' blood, and that's why they're Levitical priests. He also had Joseph, who we know suffered because his brothers sold him into slavery because he told them, you're going to bow down to me. See, that's the Melchizedek priest. You're pulled out of your brethren. You're different from them. You're the first fruits. But you will suffer for it. So that's why J Joseph's life was so horrible. And when we were studying in Genesis, why it said, I am with you. The Lord is with you. I am with you. Seven times it said it in that one chapter or the two chapters, remember? That is the signature of a Melchizedek. You've got the king priest. When God says, I am with you, I am with you, I am with you, that's the king priest. So Joseph is a Melchizedek, and he goes on his own. But Jacob gives birth to Judah, and Judah is the kings. Not all the kings are king priest, but one comes through his line, David, who reaches through all those veils and gets formed with Christ in him, even though Jesus hadn't even died on the cross. And that's David. 
David was a king priest because David was allowed to bring the Ark of the Covenant into a tent as a priest. Only a priest would be able to do that, but he was a king. So he was a king priest. And not only that, Jesus even quoted and said when they were talking about the fact that they were eating um, uh, little um, picking off buds or whatever from this kernels of wheat or whatever that was in the grain field, whatever. He said, Do you not, did you not read where David, who was a king, or he was actually at that time, he was just running for his life from Saul, that he actually got to eat the showbread. Because he came into the house of the Lord, he was running from Saul, and he said, I, we're hungry. My mighty men are hungry. And he said, well, we don't have anything to eat except for the showbread. Well, he ate it, and he didn't die. That was a big no-no. So he was a king priest because he was allowed to eat it because he was a priest. You can be a king, you can be a priest if you are a king priest. But Uzziah, who was, he had pride in him. He was a king, and he wanted to go offer, his, offer up the blood in the most holy place, and he was struck with leprosy. That's a no-no. But the king priest are the Christ. So David actually became, that's why Jesus is a son of David. David is a king priest. And he has Solomon, who is a king priest. And on down the line, Jesus. And Jesus pierced the veil to bring many sons to glory. We're right beneath them in the family tree. This is the body of Christ right here. But let's look at where the saints are that claim all the inheritance that a son gets, that an heir gets. No, they don't. They have a mediator. They're under the law. They come through Moses and the law and John the Baptist, and saints are right beneath them. They don't have eternal life. I'm telling you, that's what the Word says. And that's why Jesus was killed. <laughs> because he came and showed those priests, I am, don't you see one greater than Solomon is here? I am after the order of Melchizedek. I am a king priest. I wasn't born as a Levite like you were, but I am a king priest. I'm over you. You need to bow down before me. But he didn't do it like that because he was a suffering servant. There were two times that Messiah was going to come. They thought it was just one Messiah, two ways he was going to, I mean, I'm sorry, they thought it was two Messiahs that were going to come at different ways. One was going to be a surf, suffering servant, and that's why the Jews today are looking for their Messiah to come who's going to rule and reign. But see, he's already come as a suffering servant, and he's going to come back through the body of Christ to rule and reign. And it's the stumbling block that many people miss. Because they want that mediator. They don't want to go and stand before the face of God and get to know their daddy. Your daddy is a fierce, fierce, fierce God. Fierce spirit. Because he's a consuming fire. And if you've got sins that you're going to hide from him, you need to be afraid. But if you want to know your daddy, I wanted to know my daddy. He says, come. Come to me. I'll show you. But Angie, you've got to kill that nature that is in you that I detest. I abhor it because it wants to overthrow my son who's willing to lay his life down. You've got, I love you. I love you to pieces. But I hate that nature in you. And you've got to come to the dark side of the anointing. That dark side where those priests, when they carried that ark, you better stand 2,000 cubits back from them. You're not allowed to go into the most holy place just trampsing all up in there. There's a reason why there's fear there. And the church has taken that away. But I'm going to tell you right now, they haven't taken it away. He is still the same God today, yesterday, and forever. And if you want to know him, you're going to have to die to self. You're going to have to be transformed 
into the same image by you laying down your life and not building your kingdom here. By realizing that you came to eat the manure, to spit out the potting soil for the seeds, the diseased plants around you that don't have a clue. That their forefathers passed on an evil seed, passed on evil ground, and that whole crop has been ruined. Who's going to go and redeem that whole crop? Hopefully you are. That's what my church is about. That's why I don't fit in the church. It's a higher calling. It's not for the weak. But I'm here to tell you, it's very rewarding. Because I love my daddy. He is my father. I am not a bastard. I'm not an illegitimate child. He has spanked me. He has killed me. And I love him for it. So, Father, I've preached your message. I didn't even get through it. I can't tell you how much he wants to share this message with the world. But it's going to take tribulation for them to listen. God, I want to just cry. They won't listen until they see horror. They stumble over the stumbling stone. And it'll be too late for some of them then. They can't see truth because they love their sin that blinds them. But if you want to know your daddy and you're willing to stop sinning so that you can see the path that he lays out in front of you, he'll show you. But you've got to make choices. You've got to make choices to come to church and to read your Bible and to start developing your relationship with him in a way that you become the Tola for the seeds around you. I'm telling you, there's a lot of Christ that are here. I didn't think there were that many. But the thing is, as many are called, but few are chosen because they just don't get it. And I I weep for them. Don't let that be you. Guys, you will have no excuse. You've heard me preach these messages. If you are on this fence, if you are still under the law, and you don't, because I can give you that spiritual DNA, I have it. To them who believed, he gave them the right to be sons of God. Not born of the flesh. Not born of will of man. Not born of blood. But of God, John 1 says. I have the Melchizedek priesthood. It's my DNA. That's why I can see the Bible in patterns. I can see the hologram all the way through the Bible. Because it's in me. It's my DNA. I've been transformed. You have no excuse. I promise you, when you stand before a holy, consuming fire, you will have no excuse. Your reasons are not good enough. You've got the potential to be a king priest. 
don't throw it away. I've paid a heavy price to bring this message to you. Persecution. Nothingness. That's why Jesus comes back with vengeance. That's why Christ comes back with vengeance. Because if you don't receive my message now, you're going to get your tail whooped. That's why I give it out freely. You can tell a Melchizedek priest because they give their stuff out freely. I'm so glad that I finally have words to describe what you can have. That we can understand it. So therefore, you're going to be held more accountable. To whom much is given, much is required. If you need prayer, if this is hitting you heavy, I hope it is. Come down here and let me pray with you.